of today is Brother Jerry and the topic of the day, shall you defend yourself? And he wants us to read in John chapter 15, verse 1 to 17. I am the true vine. My father in the garden, he cured of every branch joined. To me that does not bear fruit. He trims every branch that does bear fruit, then it will bear even more fruit. You are already claim because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain joined to me, and I will remain joined to you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain joined to the vine in the same way. You can't bear fruit in lace. You remain joined to me. I am the vine, you are the branch. If anyone remain joined to me and I and I to him, he will bury a lot of fruit. You can't do anything without me. If Anyone does not remain joined to me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and, and dries up. Branch like those as those as as speaked as speaked up. They are thrown into the fire and buried. Buried. Bearing. If you remain joined to me and my word remain in you, ask for anything you wish and it will be given to you. When you bury a lot, a lot of fruit, it brings glory to my Father. It shows that you are my disciple. Just as the Father has loved me, I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commandment, if you obey my command, you will remain in my love. In the same way I have obeyed my Father command and remain in his love. Have told you this so that my joy will be in you. I also want your joy to be complete. Here is my command. Love each other just as I have loved you. No one has great greater love than the one who gives his life for his friend. You are my friend in you. Do what I command. I do, I do not call you servant anymore. Servant do not know their matters business, their matters business. Inside, I have called you friend. I have told you everything I learned from my father. You did not choose me in tide. I choose you. I, I, I choose you. I appointed you to go and bear, and bear fruit it is fruit that will last. Then the Father 
will give you anything you ask for in my name. Here is my command, love each other. Here is my command, love each other. The topic of the day is, shall you defend yourself? Let us listen. Something from our brother Gary. And brother Gary, you are welcome. everybody. It's good to be here. This is a larger crowd than I usually speak in front of. And I think last time I spoke here I had a little more hair in my head. But, um, this talk came about um, it was something I thought about one night. I was thinking about this subject of uh, self-defense if with all the things going on in the world and the crazy things and all the killings and the murders and we could have a list a hundred pages long. So I was thinking about this subject and I thought about it for quite a while at night and Woke up in the, the next morning, and it was pretty strange. One of those strange things, Caroline said, um, she asked me if I thought it was all right for us as Christians to be able to defend ourselves. And that's what these ideas are about. And it uh, might be a lengthy talk. I tried cutting it down a little bit, <clears throat> so we'll see how far we get through on this. So I told her that's exactly what I was thinking about. That same the, a few hours before. So it's one of those weird, weird things that happens. So it's like she was reading my mind, or maybe I don't know. <clears throat> we all know that the Bible talks a lot about killing and murder, right and wrong, and, and what Jesus said, as we read in the reading, it's a good thing to lay down your life for a friend. How many people would be able to do that? In Genesis 4, we start with one of the very first murders that is recorded we're going to discuss a few murders here. Cain was told, if you do what is right, now he had a little talking to, because something was going on with him. He had already been thinking in his mind, we don't know for how long, about, he, he didn't like his brother. He was jealous. He was told, I believe by an angel, if you do what is right, you will be accepted, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. Or this could have been a vision or by God. Or It desires to have you, but you must master it. So how long was it from this point, this warning time, until Cain deceived Abel? And he goes, so... I don't know the exact time frame. He, he had time to think about it. He was warned. It was known what he was thinking. And he's like, hey, you got to straighten out your thoughts here. This is not good what you're thinking. Let's go out to the field. Two brothers on a nice walk. How long was Cain planning this? Abel was attacked. He probably had no idea this was coming. And it's hard to defend yourself if you don't see it coming. 
we were thinking, there was some thinking in uh, previous uh, writings on this that them knowing how to uh, sacrifice the animals and stuff, he, they always show him using a rock and, and killing them, but could have very well been a knife and he could have slit his throat in the sacrificial manner. And there's a, an expression in the martial arts fields that anyone can be had if you don't see it coming. This murder narrative, and while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother and killed him. I, yeah, I don't think he saw it coming or had a chance to defend himself, or he probably would have defended himself as his blood went into the ground. The next murder story, and you know, Cain was, Cain was held very accountable for that. The next murder story, this person isn't really held accountable that I could find. So what about Moses? Read a little bit about Moses in Exodus chapter 2. Starting at verse 11, <clears throat> Moses flees to Midian. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. And we all know this story. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. So glancing this way and that, so he's looking all around. Seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and we knew he had to get out of there. So he's 40 years old. They asked him, who made you ruler and judge over us? So unwittingly here, it's interesting, the speaker made a prediction that would be fulfilled 40 years later. And the Hebrew word for judge could also refer to deliverer. And we don't know if the Egyptian that had been beating the Hebrew had a chance to defend himself. <clears throat> or when the two Hebrews were fighting, we don't know who had a chance. But when the Egyptian that Moses saw and was going to kill, I mean, he, he was murdered. We don't know if, how Moses did it, if he snuck up on him or just, he probably had very good training in uh, Pharaoh's house. I'm sure on uh, all the arts of war would be part of it. But glancing this way and, and that, I like the way that's a, glancing this way and that. It's ex <laughs> checking to make sure nobody's watching us. And do we do that at times? Oh, I know I do. He killed the Egyptian, he hit him in the sand, and. Uh, goes on from there, out of town. Read one thing in Acts, from chapter 7, starting at verse 23, when Moses again was 40 years old, he saw one of... Uh, his fellow Israelites, being mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptians. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. 
So another little version of that from Exodus and also in Hebrews. Hebrews 11. I you know I think that's starting at verse 24. By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead for his reward as we should also be. The thing about Moses that I didn't find in studying this was what God thought about it. He's still listed in the faith chapter. I mean, we know he didn't like the Cain and Abel thing, but we don't get too much information on uh, how he felt about Egyptians getting killed at this time. Okay, what about David? Another murderer. I hate to say that, but he was a murderer. The one who kills, even though he did not do it himself, he might as well have committed that murder. It's in Second Samuel. I can find it. Chapter eleven. It's, uh, let's see if we can shorten this a little bit. It's uh, David and Bathsheba. In the spring, at the time when the kings go off to war. David sent out Joab, out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. That was probably the first mistake. Maybe he wanted to. One evening, David got up from his bed, walked around on the roof of his palace, of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. So we find out she's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, Eliam, and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. This gets interesting. The more research you do on this, because when I researched it, I'm like, well, did David know Uriah? He was one of the great and mighty men, to find out. So from the David account, we have a lot more information than you get with the Cain and Abel account. And you've got a lot more information than you get with Moses. You get David's life unfolding before our eyes, his good things and his bad things. And we were told and are told that God loved David's heart. It was, uh, his heart was the kind of heart that God loves. And That's in just the next uh, one of the accounts of that is uh, 1 Samuel 13, 14. And I know there's more. This wasn't the actual one I was looking for, and I still haven't found it. 
and talking to uh, Samuel when he's rebuking Saul, Saul, uh, Saul had acted foolishly. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you would have, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. A man after his own heart, that was David. And he messed up. Okay, so David sends his word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sends him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master servants that did not go down to his house. This is after the sin that David had committed, and he's trying to get out of this problem now by getting Uriah to go back with his wife. I think David was in a an extreme panic and he's trying to, the best he could to get out of this mess and this whole chapter goes on with him trying to get out of this mess that he got himself into. Now, I'm not saying I'm any better or anyone else is any better. We all get into big messes. It's interesting in this chapter David never turned to God for help or for forgiveness or for advice. This is the David and the Uriah and the Bathsheba incident. This is the lust of the flesh. And I've heard that both King Solomon and King David loved beautiful women. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. So he can't get Uriah to go back with his wife. He tried and he tried. Um, he even got him pretty drunk one time and he still would not do it with his fellow soldiers. When he knew they were out at battle, he was not going to do what David wanted. So in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, sent it with Uriah. And this is just mind-boggling. He sends this letter with Uriah, with the man he wants to have killed. He's delivering his own death sentence to the battlefront in that letter. And you know that the man he handed it to was going to keep that letter. And it's been brought out. He probably kept that letter to protect himself from David in the future. So in the letter, put your eye on the front line where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So they did that, and other men also felt with him. Other men died, not just Uriah. Uriah the Hittite died. So Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He said, when you have finished giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up and he may ask you, why did you get so close to the city? And then they, they go on and on and on and embellish on the story. And then David, after the messenger talks to him, he says, 
Say this to Joab, don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After that time of mourning was over, David had her brought into his house and she became his wife. And he, she bore him a son. But this thing that David had done, this is interesting, writing. This thing David had done displeased the Lord. In Ephesians 5, we're told, But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. We have many warnings in in the Bible. And I came across some stuff, and I it was by accident in the uh, Proverbs. Things that Solomon had recorded. And it sounded really interesting because it went back to that chapter. It went back to what David had done. And it made, uh, made me wonder if this was not stuff that he had learned from David. It sounded like the exact story going on here. It's in Proverbs 6. starts at verse 17. And these are the things that the Lord hates. Seven that are detestable to him. And in 17, it is the haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. And who did that? David not only had Uriah killed, but others died with him to try to cover up his sin. He was trying to cover up everything from the world. He didn't want any. And he's thinking that God's not seeing what's going on. Now, we don't know what he was thinking exactly. He was trying to get out of the biggest one of the biggest messes in his life. Verse 18, a heart that devises wicked schemes. That's what David did. He schemed through, how can I get out of this? Feet that are quick to rush into evil. Verse 19, False witness who pours out lies. That happened in the story. It was a lot of lies. A lot of cover-up. And a man who stirs up dissension among brothers. And stirred up problems throughout all of Israel. All these things... David did, and it was recorded by Solomon, and I think that was no accident. In the same chapter, chapter 6, verse 25 of Proverbs, Proverbs, 
Do not lust in your heart after her beauty or let her captivate you with her eyes. Kind of strange the way they throw that in towards the end. That maybe should have been at the beginning. In First Chronicles, we read, like, who was Uriah? I didn't know really a whole lot about him. Just knew it was the man that David had killed. Who was Uriah the Hittite? He was, as I said earlier in the beginning, one of the mighty men. And he was a mighty man before David. And we already talked about how he wasn't the only one. We don't know how many. We're told in 2 Samuel, in the fight with Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. And in uh, the same chapter, we're reminded again, and some of the king's men died. So how many people died in David's plan? I said, I used to only think it was Uriah. Without careful reading and study, just read over that all my life. Well, what they call this, in today's language, is a premeditated murder. It's a heart that devises wicked schemes unto murder. Nathan said to David, Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? Oh, he got off. Oh, it came out now. Oh, something. He got found out. You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own? 2 Samuel chapter 12 now. He is told, now therefore, because of this, one very stupid and murderous act, now therefore the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me. Who did he despise? Not the prophet. He despised God and took the wife of Uriah. And this is um, some more good stuff here. 2 Samuel 12, 12. And this relates to us. This relates to our lives. Or it should, not the murdering part, I hope. I pray we have no murder in our heart. Although there's been times I've said I want to kill somebody and won't really do it, I hope, but I've said it. He is told by the prophet here in chapter 12, you did it in secret. David, you did this in secret, but I will do this thing that I'm going to do in broad daylight. This is God's words before all Israel. Now, he was put in front of the nation for this sin. From being in secret, a little plan in one's mind, to the whole nation knows now what you did. You will be punished. Did Uriah have a chance to defend himself? Or the others with him when the army drew back and left them there and said, oh, a woman on the wall threw something on him, killed him. Yeah, the woman on the wall. They blamed it on the woman on the wall, killed him. Okay. Remember, they had to make it look good. I don't think they had much chance to defend themselves. 
In 2 Samuel again, chapter 11, at verse 14, David wrote the letter to Joab, sent it with Uriah. As we discussed earlier, he was carrying his own death sentence letter. It's just hard to even imagine that, that David would do that. Like, let somebody else carry his death sentence letter. I think at this point, David's really losing it. In the letter, we know he wrote, put your eye on the front line where the fighting is the fiercest, then withdraw so he will be struck down and die. Imagine, if you can, Uriah's leaving with this letter, which tells the people how they should kill him. Maybe he's feeling important and trusted with this letter and responsibility. Or maybe from the way David was treating him and trying to get him to go with his wife, Maybe he's thinking something's going on. This isn't right. What's going on here? All this, all this stuff isn't right. If you were gone for a while and you got back into town and someone's telling you to go down to your house, you have to go down to your house, and you don't, and then the next day they get you drunk and you still don't go down to your house, Maybe we can think something's up, something's wrong. I think David knew this guy as one of the mighty men. Maybe he was wondering, why are the kings being so friendly to me? article somewhere on uh, Illinois murder. This is the law. This is our law. And it was written of all the shootings going on and the police shootings. So I found this a little interesting because I found it at the same time as uh, I was going over this talk. Yes, most of us think of first-degree murder as a cold, calculated act, an intentional slaying committed with malice, a forethought, not afterthought, a forethought, thinking before. The Illinois law on homicide, that's our state here, says a person who kills an individual without lawful justification commits first degree murder. If in performing the acts which cause the death, he either intends to kill or do great bodily harm to that individual or another, or knows that such acts will cause death to that individual or another, this is all lawyer stuff, it's so. Or he knows that such acts create a strong probability of death or great bodily harm to that individual or another, Section 720 ILCS 5-9-1. And there's a lot more in this article, but <clears throat> it sounds like things haven't changed in several thousand years. And I think we're running out of time. And I can't finish this in five minutes. I didn't shorten it enough. <laughs> so, you could, I'd love to get welcome back for part two, though.
sometime. In conclusion, for this first section, because the next section of this talk is, uh, yeah, 35 minutes is enough, is about Peter when he drew his sword to defend the Lord. Is it all right? And we can think about that for a while. We were told in the reading it's good to lay down your life for a friend. We're also told is it even better to lay down your life for someone we don't know? So in conclusion, is it all right to defend yourself? You can just think about that, and uh, you can wait for part two. Thank you, thank you, Brother Gary, for your wonderful message. I think today is a great day to be learning how to defend yourself. We should learn, because it's not easy, according to the difficult time that we are living. We should know, and that is why we are here every day, to learn, to share, so that we can be strong in faith and to know how to defend ourselves for the future. Thank you. Let us continue uh, by singing theme 222. When my love to God grows weak, when for large faith I see, 222.
Now is the time to remember our Lord Jesus. Let us read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 to 25. It says, when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body. It is given for you. Every time you eat it, do it in memory of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Every time you drink it, do it in memory of me. Then I will call Brother Jack to come and pray for bread. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread, which we remember as a token of Jesus' body, which was given on our behalf. We remember how he drew his disciples together around him at the table and told them to, to do this in his memory. We remember the way in which Jesus faced his, his own impending death, how he offered no defense in the, the way that, that men defend themselves, but only that he was indeed the Messiah whom God had sent. We remember his, his words about how if we put our, our trust in, in the sword or in weapons, that they would not save us and in fact would be our own destruction but that we should put our confidence in you. We ask that you help us to have faith and have wisdom and walk in the, the knowledge that you've given us until Jesus returns and we taste life anew. In his name we pray, amen. For the bread, let me call Brother Masi to pray. Let's pray. And Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day that you give to us to come together and worship you and sing for you. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your care that you 
took us from the different different nation and brought us here to worship you thank you for your great things that you've done in our life you give your beloved son his blood for our sin and he washed us through his blood bless us and keep us safe and also those brothers and sisters are not able here also bless them and with all of us and we need your son send him soon to sit together in your kingdom and we ask this pray in the name of your son Jesus Christ Amen Amen To continue, let us uh, sing hymn 405. 405, then I'll close with prayer. Shall we behold the promised land? 200, uh, 405.
Father in heaven, thank you for having this uh, great day. We put our spirit, our soul, and our body in your hand. We ask you to be with us now. Is the time to dismiss. We please you to direct us to take control for each and every step and supply our and supply your power in us to move forward in obedience of your word. Father, we pray and we believe that you're going to be with us for the whole day. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. I would like to ask. Our speaker has asked that we read from 2 Corinthians this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians 10. By the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold towards you when away. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. You are judging by appearances. If anyone is confident that they belong to Christ, they should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much as they do. So even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gave us for building you up rather than tearing you down, I will not be ashamed of it. I do not want to seem to be trying to frighten you with my letters, for some say, his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive, and his speaking amounts to nothing. Such people should realize that what we are in our letters when we are absent, we will be in our actions when we are present. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the sphere of service God himself has assigned to us, a sphere that also includes you. We are not going too far in our boasting, as would be the case if we had not come to you. For we did get as far...